Dr. Alex Bezaridis, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from Mexico. You are a professor of biology at Lewis Clark State College in Idaho, where you teach human anatomy and physiology. You recently released your first book, Evolution Gone Wrong, The Curious Reasons Why Our Bodies Work or Don't, <laughs> from HarperCollins, The Story of the Human Body's Bumpy Evolutionary Ride to Where We Are Now. Well, Alex, uh, you're on sabbatical now in Mexico uh, until the summertime. I know that part of the reason you love it there is because it doesn't affect your allergies, which is, of course, uh, one of the things that evolution hasn't quite conquered. It's been really interesting for me to be here because this time of year, as we come into spring, I usually have pretty bad seasonal allergies. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed here that they're they're just knocked back quite a bit. I, I haven't really been bothered much yet. I think I've taken an antihistamine on just a couple of days. And whereas at home, I'd be on one just about every day this time of year. Wow. And so I started reading about pollen and and seasonal allergies and, and came to learn that most of the things that give me trouble back home, all the oak trees and maple trees and grasses, you have all these plants that are wind pollinated. They're blowing gobs and gobs of pollen around. Yeah, I'm um, just chucking it into the air. And down here, most of the plants are insect pollinated and they don't use uh, nearly as much. They don't need nearly as much pollen when a little insect just moves it from one place to the next. So I don't know if that is why or if it's just the, you know, some other aspect of the change of environment. But so far, I'm kind of loving being down here because I'm not nearly as sniffly as I would be back up in, up in higher latitudes. <laughs> well, before we put evolution through the ringer, let's hear a little bit more about you. Alex, did you always have an interest in science and evolution? And what aspects of those topics led you to write Evolution Gone Wrong? I, I was always into biology. I've, I've always really liked biology ever since high, sc high school and even before. I spent a lot of time outside as a kid. We spent a lot of time camping and fishing and, and just spent a ton of time around nature. And I think that, uh, that, that automatically sort of spurs an interest in it. And I so I was I gravitated toward it in school, had some really positive experiences with biology in high school, had a great um, teacher in high school, let us do it. We had an outdoor field class in the summer that was a couple weeks long where you just, you know, you left your parents behind and you went out and went camping with your friends and, and took all these these outdoor field classes. And that really got me going. So I, I, I wasn't one of those kids that switched majors a whole bunch of times in college. Like I went in as a biology major and, and stayed that I had to kind of figure out what I wanted to do with it and i didn't know there you know i didn't know how many the option all the different options there were i sort of oh i'll just become a doctor because that's what everybody does but then i i figured out pretty quickly that there were other options i got to be really good friends with a researcher at um a teacher a professor at colorado state university and i saw his life and what he did and i thought boy that looks kind of nice so i I went off to graduate school i was going to be a kind of a molecular neuroscientist i went to study acetylcholine receptors and their structure and function. Mm. So I applied for a bunch of teaching heavy jobs. And that means you're applying for jobs at smaller schools, um, some community colleges, some small four years. And if you're a biologist, that effectively means you have to be able to teach either microbiology or anatomy and physiology, because all of those schools need those mm. classes taught. And so now I took this background mm. where I had done a I had had a lot of ecology and, and evolutionary thinking built into my program for my PhD. And then I started teaching anatomy and physiology. And then I eventually moved to Lewis Clark State College in Idaho. And where there was a little bit bigger, there's like maybe three to 4,000 undergrads. And I mean, I still had to, but I was still teaching a lot of anatomy and physiology. And, but I, I finally got to the point where I was ready to sort of start thinking about it in a different way. Instead of just thinking about like how do the structures work and how are they set up and how can I teach them? I started to think more about sort of why they are the way they are and, and apply my old thinking of, you know, that mm. I was trained in evolution to the new thing I was teaching anatomy. And the book was really kind of born out of that type of logic. I met a, I had a mentor for the first few years at the job in Idaho. He, he and I would just, 
talk shop all the time and and we would always sort of look at these these places in the body like the the trachea and the esophagus where there were just the openings are right next to each other mm-hmm. and it causes people to choke all the time as a result and we just look at that and be like how did that ever come about like how why is it that way and i would start to read about how those things evolved and the answers are just incredibly fascinating and interesting and and i thought i'm going to start to write some of this down because it's really really interesting mm-hmm. to me and even if it never goes any farther than me being able to share more of it with my students, then great. But once I realized that there's actually a whole body's worth of these kind of crazy things that have evolved that have left us sort of jury rigged, then I started to you know put, put things down a little more formally. In your book, you go into why the process of evolution took us down a wild path of trial and error, rewarding us with successes as well as lumping us with some pretty annoying failures. In it, you talk about everything from why we have blurry vision to why we as human beings came to stand on two legs in the first place. The first section of the book deals with the head and neck, and amongst other things, you talk a lot about teeth. Now, I know a lot of people can relate to dental procedures, uh, fillings, correcting crooked teeth, uh, and so on, but it seems that a lot of our dental problems link back to our cultural past, would I be right in saying that? Absolutely, it's a it's a blend of our of our evolutionary past and our and our current behaviors. As I think, the kind of everything that I talk about in the book is all these issues in the body. I think you, you know it's not just one thing or the other. It's it's a, it's both. But certainly, our our cultural past plays a role in it. Teeth were a big gateway for me to writing the book. I I was in class talking about the digestive system and showing there's a picture in the book of I, I put the sort of textbook image of teeth in the book and it just has this mouth with these 32 perfectly fitting teeth and nothing out of place and it all just looks mm-hmm. great and i was kind of thinking about my mouth at the time and like my my incisors were still moving around because of my wisdom teeth and they were starting to get to the point where i was probably going to need to have braces and so i just had the class it was a pretty big class it's the it's it's you know it's it's probably 60, 70 students. I said, all right, everybody raise your hand just real fast. And all right, now lower your hand if you ever had any wisdom teeth pulled. And so that pull out, you know, a whole bunch of people, probably half the class. And then, all right, now lower your hand if you ever had braces. And and now you're down to like five people, you know. Mm. And so then I said, okay, now the five of you that are left, now if you if you have if your teeth are kind of crooked, like you didn't have wisdom teeth pulled or you didn't have braces, but your teeth are kind of crooked, you go ahead and lower your hand too. And then, you know, out of the 60, 70 kids, you're left with two that have that have perfectly straight teeth that just got in, fit into their mouths naturally. And it just got me thinking like, man, here's another thing. Like, why is that the case? Why don't our teeth fit in our mouths? And so I started reading about that and the answers are complicated and fascinating and they bring in so many different angles beyond just our anatomy. Um, Mm -hmm. So there is this mismatch between our jaw and our teeth and a big part of it has to do with once sort of culture and society advanced enough that we that we developed these ways of processing our food such that we didn't need a big giant jaw the mutations were able to sort of stick within the jaw that weakened it and eventually made it smaller and the and the teeth have just not caught up um they're still too large for the jaw so things the one that i get into in the book a lot is talking about the origins of fire and fire making um and that and obviously and tool use so once we could cut up the food a little bit and then cook the food so that it was softer and in even more recent times, put it in a pot where you could then stew it down till it was just as mushy as you wanted. Once you could do all of those things, well, humans didn't need a large jaw, a large, powerful jaw anymore. And, and the jaw has weakened and gotten smaller over the, over the, you know, in recent evolutionary time. And the teeth just haven't caught up yet. They are shrinking, um, but they just haven't caught up yet. And they just don't fit all that well in there as a result. And, and when I started to read about that, I just thought, well, this is, this is just the most interesting stuff because it just goes so beyond, you know, just the anatomy and you get into all these things. I mean, it's just fascinating to learn about how humans started to make fire and what people think about when it happened and where it happened and how it happened. And, and it all just kind of came together. So that, that really got me running with the book. And that's why that's the first chapter of the book is all about that is all about that mismatch. 
And of course, uh, we as human beings have uh, figured out all sorts of ways of fixing our teeth, having orthodontia yeah. and so forth. We Right, and and that's bound to eventually. I mean, that's that's cer certainly playing a role in the selective process of humans. It's probably slowing down our um, the evolutionary ability to 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 fix this problem. I mean, I, I I had braces put on my teeth two years ago. Had them off in this last fall, and and so many people these days get that done at such a young age that that they're having them fixed even before they go through the you know, the process of, of finding a partner and having kids. And, and then, so, yeah, we're just going to continue now to pass on our very crooked tooth genes down and down and down. So we'll have to, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not entirely confident. I'm not confident that the evolution is going to solve that one for us. I think we're going to be stuck with orthodont orthodontics for, for quite some time. <laughs> Well, one thing I and a lot of people can relate to, as well as dental problems, is back problems. Uh, I'm just getting over back strain myself, and God, it just lays you out for days and days. It's awful. <laughs> well, in the musculoskeletal section of your book, you look into back problems and its link to the advent of our ancestors going from four legs to two. So uh, talk a little about that. Sure. So back pain is such a universal conundrum that it had to get into the book. It's the number one cause of disability worldwide. And and you, the older people get pretty much as if you, if you live a long enough life, it's going to give you trouble at some point. It's just it's a matter of sort of it's an if not when mm. kind of. No, sorry. It's a when not if <laughs> kind of kind of situation. Um, the first part of the the issues with the back that I think had to be explored and that I wanted to talk about in the book is why humans transitioned to bipedalism, because that's really what we're talking about with the back is when he, when our ancestors went from being quadrupeds to being bipeds, that sort of put the back on a path that led it to trouble. So I explore that issue a fair amount and, and the, the leading idea currently that there's a fair amount of support for the leading hypothesis is that it was driven by a change in our diet and climate change. So there was significant climate change in Africa around this point, like four to five million years ago. And and our ancestors had to leave the trees that were forced out of the trees to, to be able to forge in a different way. And down on the ground, it was a more efficient and energetically economical way to get around for us to do it on two feet. And we are very efficient at traveling long distances on two feet. And so as, as the climate dried out, there, there, it had sort of been preceded by a very wet period. And then, and then the transition was sort of a wet period. They actually, there, there are some researchers that think that wading might have been a, an important part of the transition from quadruped to biped because the water sort of so, supports the muscles um, as you're kind of in this, in this transitionary period where because other great apes, when they stand on two feet, which they do sometimes, like when they have to carry something or when they're in water, and a great ape, they have, to, they have to flex their legs. And that's really exhausting if you're on land. Um, all these years later, humans are able to sort of lock their legs to stand upright and do it in a much, in a way that doesn't take nearly as much energy. But during this transition, some people believe the water, sort of a wading stage, might have been critical to go from quadruped to biped. Um, so once humans were sort of, and really hominids, were a fully bipedal, uh, sort of on the fully bipedal path, um, the, the shape of the spine mm -hmm. changed over time to allow for a bipedal life. If you look at the shape of the spine in a, in a, in a great ape, in the other great apes, it's C-shaped. And it makes it so that if they stand up on two feet, because, of, because it's shaped sort of curved this way, it sort of naturally propels them forward and mm. it's exhausting for them to try and stand on two feet because everything about their shape of their spine is sort of forcing them to the ground to have all four limbs on the ground. Well, the human spine has two curves in it that help, that help us yes. overcome that. There's a lower curve that puts the weight back over the hips and moves the center of gravity back over the hips. So that helps us stand up. And then there's an upper curvature, a cervical curvature that gets this giant head that we try and hold on top of all of this and puts it sort of over the core of the body instead of out in front like it is in the other great apes. And those two things allow for bipedal, a bipedal life. They, they are why, and it, I, I didn't know this when I first started, started the research on it, but, but 
humans are born with a C-shaped spine, which helps explain oh. why kid, why they don't, you know, you know, other animals, you know, a horse comes out and they kind of lick the thing and then it hops up and starts running away, right? But mm. humans, you know, humans come out and they're just limp and helpless. And part of that is they have this C-shaped spine that means that there's no way they could begin to walk right away. They have to develop those curves and develop the muscles that hold all of it in place. And then that happens and they start to toddle for a while and eventually they have the the spine curvatures that and the muscles that allow them to walk around. And it just makes for a very precarious situation your whole life because the back muscles and the abdominal muscles, the core of the body, help maintain those curves and that shape. And as those muscles weaken, as you get older, or if you injure them, and then the, the curves can start to get thrown off, that's when discs start to slip and pain starts to come in and, and it can be a really difficult thing mm. to get back to that position. I, I, interview my, I interviewed my primary care physician for that, for the back chapter, because he had had just an absolute nightmare with his back. And he, he just stressed over and over and over again that he thought the trick to the whole thing was keeping your core strength. If you keep your core really strong, then that will help maintain the shape of your back and, and lead you from, from, but but that's easier said than done, obviously, as you become 40, 60, 70. And of course, that doesn't account for for acute injuries when something happens, the slip on the ice or the, the sort of acute thing that can happen that can then cause back pain. So that's kind of the middle section of the book is dealing with those skeletal issues all born of this this wild transition our, our lineage went through from a life in the trees to a life on the ground. I can relate. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it, yeah. Well, linked to bipedality is the human experience of giving birth. Standing upright led to changes in the pelvis and birth canal leading to all kinds of problems. In the section of your book that deals with reproduction, you go into the problems humans have with not only giving birth, but with pregnancy and menstruation as well. Isn't that right? And we sort of think of pregnancy as this warm, fuzzy thing, this incredible bond between mother and child, but there's a lot of conflict there between the mother and child um, right from the get-go, and, and menstruation might have been born out of, out of some of that conflict. And then, you know, you get past that, and, and through fertility, which is this whole other thing, I dedicate an entire chapter to that in the book, and you get to pregnancy and birth and there's just a whole other suite of difficulties and problems for 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 females to get through that process as well so it's it's a and then i and then i write a like kind of a happy-go-lucky conclusion where i say it's not all so bad you know so just not to leave people not to leave people on like this terrible like and birth is the worst the end kind of note you know i, I sort of try to put a happier bow on it at the end but but the whole birth process is another it's just another kind of nightmare for for humans that's a bit unique to the human process to the human so I, I think i'm right in saying well maybe i'm not that, that other animal other mammals don't have so much pain giving birth I, you're up, yeah it's shorter and it's i don't i don't i mean it's hard to ever be exactly inside another animal's head but based on everything we've observed about other animals giving birth it does not seem to be nearly the the traumatic process that it is in humans i mean it's just the perfect storm for humans because you have the changes in the shape of the birth canal because of popping us up on two feet that made the, the passage way through the birth canal um, tighter to, to fit a human baby through there and that so you, ha you already have that going on there's this great research by this this group led by Jeremy De Silva who I just think I reference his work a lot in the book he just he just wrote a book called first steps that's just I just started and it's really really great if people want to learn even more about the transition to, bi to bipedalism. Um, but he and his group studied th some of these really old fossils where they determined that, that that fit in the birth canal was tight really early on in the pathway to bipedalism. Like, you know, at the point sort of where, where hominids were st first starting to become bipedal before the brain swells up to its giant size. So you already have kind of a tight fit up on two feet and then the brain triples in size in the ensuing couple million years. And, and then you have a real mess on your hands because you have this nice tight fit to begin with. And then you put a swollen giant head in there and it just makes for this, this, this 
this pinch point where for a lot of, I mean, I mean, a lot of women would have historically died in, in childbirth and still do in parts of the world where they don't have access to antibiotics to control the infections that happen after all the, after all the trauma. It's just a, it's another topic like teeth where you'd have all these fascinating cultural and biological things coming together to make for this, this issue. Well, it isn't all doom and gloom for us. Humans are remarkably adaptable and have dreamed up lots of fixes for these evolutionary misfires. So apart from bad backs and crooked teeth and allergies, evolution has also come up with some real gems. Uh, the hands and the brain, for instance, right? For sure. And I feel like I've talked about the, the brain of a fair amount already so let's talk about the hands for a minute so when when humans become bipedal so for the lo for the longest time people thought that maybe the freeing of the hands was kind of the impetus for um for bipedalism and and the tool use and sort of the immediate ability of having hands to, to do these different things and then it was discovered that well bipedalism happened quite a long time before any evidence of tool use so now that sort of switched the thinking to maybe some other things like diet and climate change might have driven it and the need to forage in a different way. But certainly then having your hands free um, became an advantage that became something that we took advantage of along the way. And what I didn't realize until I sort of did the research for the book was how different the human hand is compared to other primate hands. I just thought, well, primates, they have opposable thumbs and those that, that's what allows us to do all these amazing things. But the human hand is is even different than other primate hands we have what's called a fully opposable thumb so mm. i other so we have longer thumbs than other primates and other great apes and shorter fingers and allows us so apparently no other primate can do this no other primate can take their thumb and touch it to the pad of every other finger and what it allows us to do i wish i had a baseball bat with me here what it allows us to do, even i'll just take this cup we can wrap our hand around something and grip it to a degree that no other prime can and with something that's small enough like a stick you can wrap all the way around it and get a really really solid grip on it and that's not something that any other primate can do they can you know they can sort of grip like this and almost hook like and swing through the trees but they they, they have no way to really employ this really solid grip that we do so that's one thing about our hands it's kind of remarkable and you can imagine how that would help you in a defensive and in an offensive way in dealing with other animals and then also, the the incredible dexterity and the ability to, to just manipulate small objects is, is a uniquely human thing. So, so you know, I I don't spend a lot of time talking about that in the book because for the most part, I'm just talking about like how our feet are just a nightmare because now we're we're asking our body to walk on two feet, and we have all these these flexible structures that were really there for like gripping and doing these things, and now they're just pounding on the earth, and and our ankles are all spraining as a result. But at the same time, you just can't forget that that while, while we suffer from those foot pain, the knee pain and all those kinds of things, we have these hands that can, that can wash the dishes and prepare dinner and, and, and gently pick our children up and, and do all these just little manipulative things that other animals can't do, which is really neat. So are you saying that our brains uh, possibly grew in order to like keep up with what our hands were doing? Yeah, I think there. I think there's some truth in that. The it, if you sort of look at when things happened, the the hands became free quite a period of time before the brain swelled up in size. So the and and I, I think there's some probably some truth in that that the the hands were kind of an outlet hmm. for the brain. And so as as animals were able to use their hands in more effective ways, and those were the animals that were selected for that in turn selected for animals with bigger brains that could hunt better that could process the food in different ways, that could make their life um, not just more comfortable, but, but more efficient that led, you know, that led ultimately to more children and, and, and passing those genes on. And so, yeah, I think, there's, I think there's a lot of truth in that, that you know, who knows if the brain would have ever swelled up to its current size if we hadn't had our hands free to begin with. Well, for better or worse, evolution keeps on working and we try our best to work with it. And I'm sure that people will get a lot out of your book, Evolution Gone Wrong. So uh, what's next for you, Alex? Uh, after your sabbatical in Mexico, you'll be back to teaching in the fall. Uh, is uh, perhaps a new book in the works? Yeah, you're right. So back to the classroom for me this fall. I have, um, I have a really fun fall lined up. I have the introductory major biology class and all of its labs 
um, queued up. Our, our college is really unique in that it's, it's small enough that the, all the professors teach their own labs. So you really get to know the students really well. And I'm looking forward to getting back in the classroom this fall. And I also have that mixed with I get, I'm teaching my entomology, my insect class this fall, which gets me outside with the students and we do all the sampling and, and have the students learn all about the local insects. So that's, that's really fun. I'm looking forward to that. And, and cicadas yeah, I, as well. Um, <laughs> say, say, that, say that again. The cicadas? No, yeah, them so, yeah, no, no. <laughs> so the cicadas have gotten a lot of press. The periodical cicadas that get the most love for the most part are an East coast phenomenon in the U S when I, when I was in graduate school, um, there was, I don't think it was the 17 year one. I think it was one of the 13 year ones. It was, uh, it had its big explosion and blow up when I was there and it wasn't right where we were living, but we drove off to find them. Cause I had to just, I just had to see it. So we spent a weekend and drove down South into Virginia to Shenandoah national park and saw the, the explosion of cicadas. So yeah, I don't, I'm trying to think of a, I don't think a cicada has been brought in by a member of the class, but every time I teach the class, somebody brings in something different that I've never seen in the area before. So I'll, I'll let you know if a cicada ends up in the collection this year. So that'll be, that's my, that'll be my teaching life. And then for, I, I do have sort of an idea that I'm working on for a follow-up book. I'd like to, I'd like to explore these same kind of thinking with allergies and autoimmune disorders, thinking about how the immune system evolved and how it got to this point where so many people have allergies and where autoimmune disorders are such a problem for for humans and kind of applying the same kind of thinking to that. But I'm just really in initial stages of, of reading a whole bunch of journal articles. And I have stacks and stacks of papers I brought here to Mexico on dust mites and, and bee venom and pollen and, and, and peanuts and all these different things that I'm sort of putting together some initial ideas about, about how to organize it. And it's not a thing yet. I have to see how this first one goes and, and whether or not I'll do a second one, but I love this kind of thinking and I learn so much when I I'm reading for it that that spills over into my teaching and to all aspects of my life. Like just like I was talking about with the wind pollinated versus insect pollinated plants. It was not something I'd ever yes. really thought about before. And now it's all I think about when I I mean, I'm gonna get back home and there's a giant pin oak across the street from where we live that just is shedding uh, billions yeah. of of grains of pollen every year and I can't help not think about it, you know, so I, I love learning those kinds of things, even if they do or do not turn into future books. And the subject of uh, your book would, I think would make a great TEDx. What do you think? Yeah, that, that might be something down the road. I've had a couple of people say that. And I, I think these are just such broad topics that everybody that just apply to everybody that I think, they, it would be it's great because good. everyone can relate to teeth problems and back. Right. Problems. I mean, you can't get, you can't get a, but, but a couple chapters into the book, I even say at some point, like if you, I mean, one of these things has to have happened to you. I guarantee that yeah. you have either had trouble with your teeth or you're currently using glasses or at some point in the last couple of weeks, like you had a little bit of liquid go down the wrong pipe and you choke just a little bit. <laughs> happens to everybody. Yeah. You mean you talk about convergent e evolution or mitochondrial DNA? You can't really relate, but you say bad back than <laughs> most people. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got that. And that, it's the same thing with allergies. And autoimmune disorders, I mean, those everybody has, they either have something themselves or they, they're they one degree away from somebody that is allergic to milk or allergic to peanuts or allergic to something. Wow. And, and then you have a, an interesting conversation with them. So, Well, your book is available now in hardback, audio CD, and audible download. I will leave links to those as well as your social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you very much indeed, Alex, for coming on to Evolution Soup. Thanks so much for having me. I just, I love getting a chance to talk about science and evolution just generally. And I just, I just hope that uh, people enjoy the book and, and I, I really appreciate all the feedback and, and thanks for giving me a chance to, to be on the show.